seeing what I'm seeing and hearing what I'm hearing. Okay. Well, in the meantime, while um, everyone kind of gets situated, maybe it'll take a bit to get to everyone and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Abriza Jaws. I work as a junior doctor in the NHS, and basically this entire webinar is about the role of the junior doctor in the NHS. It's not going to really cover what a registrar or above does. That's going to be for a separate seminar, but I've got a couple of things written out in front of me, so if I'm looking down, I do apologize just so I don't go off topic and we cover all the important parts. But um, where I really want to start off with all of this for you all is we're going to first talk about the hierarchy of how, how the NHS looks at a junior doctor. <clears throat> and by what I mean, what I mean by that is what is a junior doctor? So junior doctors consist of the foundation year doctors and the core trainee doctors. The foundation year doctors are your FY1s and your FY2s. And your core trainee doctors are your CT1s and your CT2s. Now that it's become internal medicine training, it'll basically be IMT1, IMT2, IMT3. But just for the sake of what everyone knows right now, these are the, the terms and the names that I'm going to use. Okay? So your general role can, can vary from um, hospital to hospital. The way that certain hospitals will set up a rota or the tasks that will be um, basically asked for you to be done in your ward, it can vary from hospital to hospital, which is why it's very important when you apply for a job to read what the person's specification and job description is. If you don't read that, you won't really know what you're getting into. But what you can essentially know from each side is that you're going to have, you're going to have basically ward duties and you're going to have on-call duties. So let's talk about ward duties first. Now A&E is, is different. So we're gonna talk about A&E after I discuss just general wards. In the ward itself, depending on your ward, what kind of ward it is, if it's a medical ward or surgical wards or peds or anything like that, your job essentially would be to follow around in ward rounds, um, put together discharge summaries, do bloods if needed. For the most part, when you look at the, the team that you'll have, um, in your ward, they're going to be healthcare assistants. They're going to be nurses. There's going to be, you know, a nurse manager, a sister who's going to be the head of everything there. There's going to be you and your colleagues as the junior doctors. You're going to have a registrar, maybe two registrars, and there's going to be a consultant. There could be, if your ward is especially large, two teams or three teams or four teams in one department and you'll be part of one team. You'll report to one consultant and perhaps you'll have one or two registrars to report to as well and they will delegate tasks for you to do. A lot of wards will have a phleb that will come and do the bloods or the nurses will do the bloods but sometimes if after a ward round there are extra tasks to be done or if it's a particularly difficult individual to cannulate or to get bloods from, you will be asked to do that as the junior doctor. Um, and then you just delegate those tasks amongst your colleagues who, who will do what. Beyond that, you could be asked to catheterize patients, to do blood cultures, to do VBGs, to do ABGs. ABGs for the most part are doctor's tasks. Um, nurses aren't required to do the qualification to do ABGs in most hospitals. But again, it could be different in your hospital. It's definitely not something you should shy away from, though, if you want to pick up on good clinical skills. So let me then talk about A&E a little bit. So when, you, when you're working in A&E, the situation is very different, different in the sense that it's not a ward setting. You're basically going to think of it as, as one big triage area that has cubicles. The patients come in, you pick up the patient, and you see what needs to be done for them in a certain amount of time, and then you talk to somebody about it. So as the junior doctor, it's very important that you remember in A&E to speak to your seniors. Even if you're very experienced, the system is different, and A&E is one of those fast pla you know, paced places that if you, if you miss a trick, it can be very detrimental for the health of the person. So when you pick up a patient in A&E and you start seeing them, you will have to basically put together a quick plan, give a quick treatment option, like maybe give them some fluids, maybe some antibiotics or pain relief, Talk to your senior about it if they're happy with it, and then you all kind of jointly decide, can this patient go home, or should this patient maybe be referred to medicine or gynae or ortho or wherever it is appropriate, and then you would maybe do a referral for this patient. You might have to speak with a registrar or a colleague, I mean an SHO I mean, at your level in that department, and explain to them, listen, I've got this patient here, 
And I, I think it's more appropriate for them to come under you all because they have whatever going on. All right? But um, A&E, you will definitely be doing more bloods, cannulating um, ABGs than you would necessarily on, on a ward, depending on what ward you're on. If you're on respiratory wards, obviously ABGs are the norm there. But for the most part, if you're unsure about how good you are with certain clinical skills because it's been a while or you really want to kind of jump into seeing how everything is done, a and &E is a fantastic place to start. And I, I know I say this a lot because I started in A&E myself. But honestly, even with the amount of experience I thought I had under my belt or the amount of skills I thought I had, being in A&E kind of gave me that extra boost that, no, I know I can do this. And we do have a post covering um, about how A&E is set up and what you can expect when you're working in A&E. So I would definitely recommend you all to check it out. Um, it's very nicely put together what A&E has, what a &E um, you can expect from a &E, and in the long term whether or not you'd want to be in a &E. So beyond that, we talked about those reward duties. Let's talk about on-call duties. If you are in a &E, you don't have any on-call shifts because a &E on its own is its own level of anti-socialness. Um, what it basically means when you're on-call though for other departments is you could be doing certain tasks like ward cover, and then the other task that you might have is, is like an admission duty or a take is what they call here. So when, when it talks about ward cover at your level, depending on where you are, you might be doing certain ward covers for certain medicine departments or surgical departments or um, um, gynae or obs or anything like that. <clears throat> so... At an FY1, FY2 level, they tend to give you wards that are easier to cover versus at a CT1, C2 level, they might give you more difficult wards, more difficult wards being like a respiratory ward where there might be a lot of things that could happen very quickly that you might need to, you know, get after. Um, essentially what you would be doing, because you're on call, this is outside of the normal working hours and you are taking care of all the things that maybe couldn't get done during the day, maybe something needs to be followed up, you need to see if a CT report has come back for a patient, if a chest x-ray has been done, if a blood report you know, is back and maybe you need to act on that blood report. For, for instance, let's say at four o'clock, your colleague um, did the potassium level for a patient and it was six, and they took all the necessary measures, but they said in one hour you know, or two hours, we're gonna check it again, can you please check it and, and do what's necessary? So you'll go back to the ward or you can be sitting somewhere and check on the computer what is the potassium level for that patient now and perhaps it's still high. You'll be then expected to do the, the things that required to make sure the potassium level comes down. And you'll have a registrar for you in case you need help. It's not that you're gonna be completely out there on your own, but you'll basically be given a pager or a bleep, which I'll talk about in a second and you'll be asked to go to different wards and, and check after those patients. You don't have to do a full ward round. No one's asking you to see every single patient because, I, like I said, it's an on-call duty. It's whoever becomes acutely unwell or if there's anything that the nurses are concerned about that you need to check after. Um, but for the admission portion of it, or the take, what that basically is, you're going to be in the acute medicine department or the clinical decisions unit or whatever equivalent your hospital's name has, has named it as, because there are different names for it in different hospitals, but essentially it's the acute medicine department where um, after A&E patients who are going into medicine will go there. Surgery has their own thing, but they don't have a separate acute department. Essentially, the, they, come, the, they come down to A&E to see the patients rather than you having to be, in, as, in, as in a medicine field, you can be in the acute medicine department and the patients would eventually come there. Typically, surgeons come and see the patients in A&E first, but again, this can vary from your hospital. So just see what works once you get there. But essentially what you're doing, you're, you're going to be given a booklet or performa for, from your department that'll basically have, you know, at the top it'll say, this is the patient's name, what time were they admitted, what is their NHS number, who are you, you know, where are you seeing them, and what is the complaint that the patient has brought today. So in that, you basically put out the patient's history, um, 
you put in there what else there is that perhaps, you know, uh, any past medical history, do they have anything relevant that you need to mention, any medications that might they might be taking, um, how are things for them at home, do they need help at home, are they normally fit and independent on their own. You might want to look at certain portions of it to see if, if the patient is known to have dementia or the patient maybe has come in acutely confused, ask them certain questions so that you can gauge now where they are, and then later on when your colleagues see them, where they could be. And then there's going to be an examination portion where you just fill out from after you examine the patient, you know, what, what are your findings, any uh, significant blood findings. And then it's going to ask what you think your differential is. Your diagnosis doesn't need to be perfect because obviously you may maybe don't have all the information in your hand right now. You maybe you want to do some more tests or run some more things in, in a couple of minutes and you won't have that information right in front of you. So what's important for you to do is just to choose one or two logical diagnoses or differentials that you think would be appropriate for this patient. For instance, if, if the individual came in with chest pain radiating to the back and up to the arm and to the neck, I mean, if you put down you think it might be a urinary tract infection, you probably are going to be asked why you're thinking that. So whatever you put down, make sure you have reason to back up why you think it is. Yes, definitely, you're going to be thinking heart attack here, but you know you wouldn't be wrong into thinking maybe the patient might have a pulmonary embolism or a really bad chest infection if you can back it up with what the patient has given in the history. So after you do this part, after you've done this take, you need to let your consultant know essentially. There's going to be some clipboard or some booklet or something where you've put down this patient has been seen by so-and-so, and I think that they might have this and this, and this patient now needs to be post-taken. The post-take, after the take, basically, that you've done, is, is going to be done by a consultant, and they're going to come and see this patient with you. Okay? So they're going to first come to you, and, and they're going to basically want an S-bar. They're going to want to know what is the situation, the background, the assessment, and, and basically what have you done? What are your recommendations for this patient? What do you think is a good plan for this patient? And this is a great way for you to kind of build your own confidence because you know, you're talking to someone who can give you some feedback. You've only you know, put in a couple of changes for this patient maybe in, in the last few minutes or maybe in the last hour or so. So if anything needs to be modified, it can be done then. The consultant will maybe look over some bloods with you or any scans if anything new has come up and they'll come and see the patient with you there, and then you will write in the post-take section essentially whatever the consultant tells you to write. Um, some consultants are, are very verbal, they'll tell you as they do it. Some consultants maybe tell you when they leave. It's just, I mean, every person's different, you just gotta roll with what comes at you. But basically, you should put everything in there that they do, like, you know, oh, they examine the patient, the patient said that they smoke this many cigarettes a day, the patient has a cough, what kind of cough. And then at the bottom, it'll be the consultant's plan for what should be done. You know, the patient needs to be admitted or doesn't need to be admitted. The patient requires fluids or the patient requires antibiotics, anything like that. How long they expect the patient to be in hospital, whether or not um, they need to go to a particular ward or perhaps just stay where they are in the acute medicine department. And then you sign it at the bottom. It's definitely a good practice. Um, in your, in your first couple of post takes to show the consultant afterward what you've written and if they're happy with it because it's not just your neck on the line, it's there as well because you've put that I've seen this patient with you know so-and-so consultant and it's it's generally assumed that it's, it's an agreed upon plan. Um, but don't expect that you need to know everything right then and there. If they tell you, oh, you need to go get this test done and you don't know how to do that test or where to get that test done, there's no harm in asking. I mean, you're on this job for the long term, you, you can't know everything from day one. So it's definitely very important, if at any time you have any questions, know who to ask, know the people within your team, know the people in your department, know the nurses, know the staff, know the healthcare workers, know them by name. I mean, that makes things easier, at least for me. Like if, if I know that so, I know someone's name, I, I, I don't feel as you know awkward, should I approach them, should I ask them anything? Because you get to know them. They are somebody that you're gonna be seeing every day. So go up to them and be like, hello, Jim, how are you today? I was just wondering, I needed to get a CTKUB done for the patient in bed five. How do I book a CTKUB? And if Jim knows, Jim will tell you. If Jim doesn't know, Jim will be like, you know what, I think Karen might know. And there you go. Um, now, obviously you can't always be asking because at, at some point you'll be expected to know. So what I did at least when I first started, I, I kept one of these little tiny notebooks in my, and you can see it's very, very filled. Um, I kept it with me in my pocket. I, I wear scrubs. Um, 
And the scrubs have a nice size pocket and I made sure that this fit in the pocket of my scrubs. So whenever I would need it, I would just put information like, for instance, um, some of the rooms have locks. I would put the different codes for the different lock rooms. Um, I put in here what for any, like they, ha they have a code for what colors mean what and I just kind of put that in here. Or what are the general approaches for certain patients when they come in with acute asthma attacks. Um, this was very useful for me. I don't use this now as much because I've kind of understood the system. But it is a good thing to go back to if I forget about something or if I need to know something that I've written before. I still carry it with me. I don't add, like I said, I don't add much to it now, but it doesn't hurt to keep some extra papers with you in case you need to know something or write something down, especially since you can't always ask someone. So the times that you can, it's good to keep it down so that the next time you won't necessarily have to ask someone, okay? Um, beyond that, know your limits once you start working in the NHS. It's all well and fine that you're a new doctor and you're an international graduate and you think that people are going to expect a lot of you. And that's true. They, they probably will have higher expectations for you since, you know, you're coming from somewhere else and they want to see what you're, you're worth. But that doesn't mean that you need to prove anything to anyone if it means hurting your own self. You know, don't overwork. Don't stress yourself out. Don't try and take all of the things on your shoulders. If at the end of the ward round, the consultant is like, there, there are five bloods that need to be done and three ABGs and two urinary catheters, don't say, I'll do all of them. You know, No one's going to think you're a hero if you're going to say, I can do all of these things. I mean, you're only human. Do as much as you are able to do. If it's your, you know, your first month, if you're doing a sh you know, shadowing period and then you start working, see how things are delegated. See what your abilities are and try and just, you know, kind of tiptoe into it rather than run into it full stream. Because you don't want to make a mistake, first and foremost. And then secondary to that, whenever you're trying to do something, it's easier if you have a small amount of things to do and then you concentrate on those things and then you move on to something bigger. So for instance, if, you know, you're not really confident with doing ABGs, try and say that, okay, every time that there is an ABG that needs to be done, I will do those ABGs. You know, and then that will be your one task that you've done. Set those small goals for yourselves, how many cannulations you can do or how many catheterizations you can do. And even if you feel that you're not 100% at them, what you can do is um, a lot of the times, if you look on your hospital's hub, their own intranet, the uh, basically the website for the hospital where you can see your rota or you know, any new things that are going to be happening, any teachings. You can see about any courses that you can book as well. There are courses, for instance, in my hospital for like ABG, for cannulations, for different things like that, that maybe if you feel like you need that little bit of a confident boost, you go ahead and book them. Um, with that, you should definitely try and find as many teachings as you can beyond whatever is part of the curriculum in your hospital. So obviously, like, there's going to be something that your hospital will have teaching-wise. They're going to maybe do weekly, you know, cardiology sessions or a respiratory talk or grand rounds or, or something like a journal club that you would, you would, you know, be expected to attend. But beyond that, you can see if there are any other teachings um, that you could attend, if there are any other kind of, you know, um, courses that you could do like ALERT or ILS or BLS or ALS. A lot of hospitals do offer ALS within, within the trust themselves. You don't have to go to a different hospital. And that's definitely a good advantage if you think about it, that, you know, if this is something that you want to do. So definitely, let's, if we kind of back up a little bit, if we first think about, you know, when you come to choosing the hospital itself, um, we have a little post on it about, you know, choosing the right hospital, essentially covering what you think, um, you would want to look for in a hospital because without that you can't really think about anything in the long term what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for a hospital you need to know you know is it something that location wise is good for you is it something that um, the workload is something that you want is it something that you want to do in the long run and if it's not then don't take that kind of a hospital job I mean or don't take that kind of post because it's more about how do you want to do what you're doing, okay? Um, beyond that, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the things that you need on the ward. So like I said before, I wear scrubs when I, when I go to work um, because it, it makes things easy for me. I, I, uh, my hospital provides scrubs and then I don't have to worry about staying always bare below the elbow um, or looking for outfits that are always bare below the elbow. And plus, I don't want to, 
I mean, you're in a hospital setting. There are a lot of people that are very sick. You don't want to bring that home with you. That's just me, though. Um, with that, just speak with your hospital about scrubs and what they offer. a &E tends to have different scrubs anyway, so it's all in that sense. Um, so the things that you will get, you will get an ID badge. This is my little ID badge. Um, I prefer clips to lan um, lanyards. And I think actually the NHS even talks about that they don't really want you to have lanyards or anything that hangs, but people still wear lanyards. I just don't want anything falling on the patient when I see them. That's just me. If you want to clip on, you can clip it onto your pocket or the top of your scrubs or wherever, and that's fine. Um, again, I will talk about the handy dandy little notebook. Very important. Um, all the information you could ever want in one notebook that you can carry around that'll fit in your pocket. Pens. I mean, that's really obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people come to work without pens. Most departments will keep extra pens, but you know, it's up to you. You can keep the straightforward, simple pens, or if you want to go hi-fi, buy a really expensive pen, but do not lose it. People do lose their pens because somebody will borrow it and then you will forget because you get paged somewhere and there goes that pen. Um, the obvious, again, stethoscope. Mine is green. You can have whatever color you want or whatever style you want. Mine is the Lippmann 3, I know, the Classic 3. People talk about should they get the cardiology one or, you know, get whatever works for you. If you are going to be a cardiologist and you want to hear a bunch of rumors, that would probably be more appropriate. Obviously for peds, getting a smaller one would also be appropriate. And then for gynae, there are special stethos. So whatever's appropriate for your speciality, get those. Um, then the next important thing is this little guy, your pager or your bleep as they call it here. All the departments do not have them. a &E does not have these. But your hospital will basically have a code which you will call into and then you can put like my, my bleep numbers on the back of, of my, um, my, my pager. And if a person needs me, they would just bleep me and then I would be informed. So my hospital has a nice little system. It, it just beeps once, not too loud. And it even tells you sometimes at the bottom if there's any important message. For instance, if there's a cardiac arrest, it'll say cardiac arrest. Um, but that's only when you're on call that you're carrying the cardiac arrest bleep or major hemorrhage or peri arrest. But Essentially, your day-to-day -day having the pager, you don't, I mean, sometimes it's hard to get into contact with somebody on their phone. Maybe you don't hear the phone ring. Your phone shouldn't be on when you're at work anyway. It should be on silent. So maybe somebody needs to get to you, the nurse wants to know something about a patient or a discharge or your reg needs to know where you are. Just go ahead and you have a bleep and they can bleep you and you are set. Okay. Um, another thing that I carry, and this, this is just up to you, because after you see every patient, you're going to okay. antiseptic and wash your hands. I carry a little bottle of lotion because my hands get very very dry and cracked and I just think that it's just it it's not worth it after seeing 20 or 30 patients in a day your hands feel very yucky and I can't touch things very well afterwards but like I said it's very small so you can just stick it in your pocket and carry it with you some people like to carry little bags and I mean I know some of the guys out there will be like no I won't carry a bag but you I mean you can carry a little laptop size bag or man purse or whatever they call it these days and it's fine you can leave it in your ward there's going to be a place that you can leave it and if you want to come back in there and wash your hands or sorry you know put lotion on your hands a lot of the wards do have lotions but I just like carrying it with me because it's, it's just more convenient. All right, so that's just kind of covering the general aspects of your role. Um, there is another important aspect that I want to cover, and that's about handover. So handover works differently in different hospitals. Each hospital has their own setup of how they want the handover to occur. But the basic concept of what a handover is stays the same. So first, I'll talk about in A&E how handovers generally happen, because it's quite short as compared to any of the more mainstream departments. Really what happens in A&E, because the, the shifts are so different timing-wise, like you could be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, your colleague could come at 5 o'clock in the evening, it could be at different times, you know, or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, what you need to keep in mind, though, is you won't be able to obviously see all the patients in one go, now can you? Because it's impossible, you're seeing as many as you can. So what you need to remember is at some point, if you see, start seeing a patient at three o'clock and you have to leave at five, you have to keep it in the back of your mind that everything won't maybe be done for this patient by the time you have to leave at five o'clock, all right? So you've seen this patient, you've sent them for an x-ray, you sent them to get some bloods done, all of these things are done. Everything's not completely come back yet, but you think maybe this patient needs to stay in or maybe there's something more that needs to be done which will happen after five o'clock. So when your five o'clock colleagues come or any colleague you know that will still be there for a good amount of time, obviously don't hand this off to a colleague that will leave at six because 
it's just an hour more. You want to give that a good time buffer. So if you have a colleague who's going to stay there for some time, you just go over to them and you basically break down to them that this is a, you know, 67-year-old gentleman who came in with abdominal pain and he's got a very bad cough and, oh, man, his CRP is really high. His infection markers are through the roof. I think he might have a chest infection. He might maybe even have gastroenteritis, but we need to rule out ACS. Whatever you're thinking, you just explain to them. And you should also make sure you've written it very well. Documentation is extremely important. It's one thing to th that you're thinking about it, but if you've not written it, it's not happening. Remember that. It's, it's, a, it's a major issue in medical legally as well. If it's not written down, that's not what anyone's going to think. That just because you thought it, no one can read your mind. So write down what your plan is. I like to actually write down plan and then what I think we're going to do next for this patient. That maybe this patient needs a troponin done, the patient needs this done, the patient needs that done. So let's say, for instance, your patient is having chest pain and you're thinking he might have AC, he needs to, you know, get some sort of ACS treatment. You've done a first troponin, which has come back kind of high, but you're not fully convinced that it's, it's anything until you repeat your troponin. Well, since you need to put that gap of hours between your first and your second troponin, you're not going to be able to see the second troponin. So you explain that to your colleague that you're handing over to, that this is what I'm looking for. If you think that this patient needs to stay in after that troponin, go ahead. I think it's appropriate to refer this patient. Or, you know, I don't think this patient maybe would need to stay in if the troponin comes back fine. Perhaps we could give this treatment and send them home. Whatever is appropriate. Um, for medicine, the handovers, or basically all the other fields, surgical and gynae and all, the handovers are a little more structured. What happens is you'll be asked to come to a handover room in a, or for a handover meeting, and they'll tell you where to go for that. Um, everyone comes there, FY1, FY2, CT1, regs, CT2s, you know, any other middle grades, consultants and stuff like that. The consultants are usually there in the mornings or during the daytime handovers, not for the nighttime handovers or the weekend handovers. They might come. It's, it's up to, again, it's up to the hospital or how that consultant is. But um, basically what will happen is if you are having any of those on-call duties that I mentioned earlier, be it ward cover or those take admissions that you're doing. So, for instance, um, you're going to come on in the morning. You have the morning take. The whole day you're going to be admitting patients. So you come to work at, let's say, 9 o'clock in the morning, and your colleague who is doing night duty, who is seeing the patients, admitting the patients during the night, they're going to hand over to you that, listen, overnight 15 patients came in. This is what's going on with them. Just very briefly what's going on with them. Also, there are already 20 people in the ward. Here's, I mean, if there's any concerns about those patients, for instance, maybe a patient who's already been admitted for one or two days has been vomiting a lot. Can you just keep an eye on their bloods, check their U and E's, maybe see about fluids, something like that. They'll give you a form that, that has all the patient's information on it, and you just kind of jot down what needs to be done or, you know, keep it in your your little book, whatever works for you, but make sure if it's anything in here that has NHS information, you cannot leave the hospital with it. It needs to go in the confidential bin. So put things somewhere where you will not lose it and keep it with you, you know, because basically at the end of your day, you're going to be handing over to the night team again. So whatever information perhaps the day team has told you about a patient that you need to hand over to the night team because some patients have continual care. The care doesn't stop just because we go home or just because a night team comes on. Certain patients need continuous monitoring or certain things need to be flagged. If there's something that you need to hand over that you feel is really not appropriate for a junior doctor to see, for instance, that you think it's something that a registrar needs to see, you can mention it in the handover that I think this is appropriate for a reg review. The reg will then decide, you know, yeah, is it appropriate or is it not appropriate? But I mean, it's not wrong if you think, well, this patient is very hemodynamically unstable. I think it's better for a registrar to see them. If they're newsing at a certain way, then they, the NHS has a national system where essentially you get warned about whether or not a patient is acutely unwell um, due to whatever things, be it their blood pressure being too low or they're not breathing very well or they need oxygen. If a patient is newsing very high, and this isn't a normal news for them because some people do have a, a normal baseline that is a little bit higher than than everyone else you should pr perhaps ask for the registrar to come and review this patient so like i said the new score the national Ear early warning signs these are things that you should keep in mind um for obstetrics i believe it's it's o e it's like oews i don't i don't think there's a really way to shorten it and then children it's pews score it's it's different for everyone but it's it's the same general concept 
if they're scoring high on this system, it's not good. You should speak to a senior about it. So um, that would be like for your on-call handovers. For a ward cover handover, it's essentially the same. You know, I saw ward 5 to ward 10 last night, and I just want to hand over that the patient in ward 7, um, bed 4, he's been coughing a lot. Or, you know, and I'm concerned that if he keeps coughing, we might need some, to do something. So basically, whatever concerns that you have, any bloods that you need the, to be seen during the day or during the night, depending on what time of your shift it is, um, any concerns that you might have throughout the day about a patient, these need to be mentioned in the handover. I kind of want to just reiterate that if there is any time that you are lost, that you are confused, if you are unsure, just please ask somebody. Don't take it upon yourself that somebody's going to look down on you for asking. There have been times when I was like, if I ask this question, they're going to think I'm stupid. But when you think about it, do you want to be thought to be stupid for five seconds if somebody does think that? Or do you want to be in a lot of trouble because you've done something really wrong? Or you've done something that perhaps shouldn't have been done because you didn't know that that's not how it's done here? Because there are a lot of medications that we would give at home, for instance, for a chest infection that they don't give here. And if you gave that, people might be asking, well, why are you giving this? Or maybe the dosing is different. Like for instance, um, gentamicin is not dosed the same way in the UK as it is in a lot of countries in South Asia. So if you didn't know that and you dosed it as you thought was appropriate, it would not be good in the long run, especially considering the side effects of gentamicin. Um, let me just see about any questions that y'all might have. Okay. So, you've never done an ABG. That's understandable. I don't think a lot of us have maybe done ABGs back home. So what you can do for that, um, if you have a period of shadowing or if there's even any colleague on the ward who knows how to do an ABG, so what you can do is, let's say you're working and you know patient Bob requires an ABG. So your colleague Sarah knows how to do an ABG and you just ask Sarah, Sarah, is it okay if I come in with you and watch how you do this ABG? So Sarah will take you inside if she's fine with it and they'll introduce you to the patient, like patient Bob, hi, my name is Sarah, this is my colleague, He's just going to watch me do this ABG. I have to take some blood from here. Is that okay? Patient Bob is happy. If Sarah is happy and if you're fine with it, you can watch how she does it and you can see the steps involved. And then the next time you can maybe ask, Sarah, can you watch me do it? Or maybe you want to ask one of the registrars or you can see in your hospital if there is any sort of provision for you to get any training on how to do it. Okay. Is there a shadowing period for every job in the beginning? This is something you should ask in your interview. At the end of your interview, when they say, do you have any questions for us? Just be like, yes. My first question is, is there any sort of shadowing? Because some hospitals will kind of expect you to know what you're doing and maybe they won't offer much of a shadowing while others will kind of have a lengthy sh um, shadowing process. Um, at least try and get two weeks of shadowing if you can. Two weeks to a month, not more than that. After a month, you should really know what's what's going on. Um, definitely during that shadowing period, ask a lot of questions, see what everyone's doing. Follow everyone around. You know, it doesn't have to be a doctor. You can follow around the advanced care um, nurse practitioners or the advanced care practitioners. They know what they're doing just as well as the rest of us do. They are at a junior doctor level. So if you have any questions or concerns, they have a lot of experience and they are very helpful in case you are confused about anything. Okay. Um, is only black ink allowed? Yes. <laughs> Do not use other colors. Uh, pharmacists, at least in my hospital, use green. So that's kind of one of the differentiating ways to know who's doing what. Um, and I believe physiotherapists use blue. I'm not 100% if these colors are the same at every hospital. But I do know for sure black ink means doctors are writing, so write in black ink. Do not bring in gel pens or sparkly pens or anything like that. Okay. Are we always supervised during the initial days of our non-training jobs? In A&E you are. I'll be point blank with you. In A&E there's never a time you are not supervised. It could be 2 o'clock in the morning and you are working in A&E night shift, but there is a registrar. Um, for other wards, it may not always be true. The reg could be busy elsewhere. The consultant is always busy somewhere. He's usually or she's usually there just maybe for the rounds or to see something. And then they have clinic duty and the reg sometimes will go to that clinic duty too. So you're not necessarily always going to be fully supervised. It might be that midday all the you know jobs are done on the ward and it's just you and your other junior doctor colleagues on the ward completing any other follow-ups or any discharges. 
but there's not going to be any, you know, mid-level or, or consultant necessarily watching you as you, as you work at those times. Um, any book recommendation for IMG to settle into NHS? So we have a couple of posts about this, but I mean, really, if you want to know about straight up, I would tell you to get the medical interviews book, and I'll, I'll link all of that at the end. The medical interviews book is, is fantastic. It helps you understand how to approach all the questions and scenarios you would ever need, even for a non-training job towards a training job. Um, other books that I would kind of recommend are, there are a couple of books out there that help you understand British slang. And I always find those to be really useful because um, depending on what part of England or Wales or Scotland that you're living in, they have a lot of little things that they say that maybe you've never heard of or you, you wonder why. Like, for instance, um, in Yorkshire, a lot of times um, either the patient or the nurse, they might call me duck. And I was a little confused at first why they would call me duck. Um, but it's just, it's just a term of endearment. They, I mean, that's just one of the nice ones for them to be like, duck, can you do this for me? And I'm like, why are they calling me duck? And then I see that, you know... That's, that's actually what they mean, that, that, that that's just how they're talking. Or they use love a lot, um, my love, or, you know, th these little things so that you won't be kind of off-put, why are they calling me these things so quickly, or other little um, things that they say or words that they use that kind of help you understand what the patient wants and what they want. <clears throat> how to manage MRCP exams with duties and how to ask for re reimbursements. All right, so... Definitely, when you start working or when you do your interview, you should ask about study leave. Study leave would allow you to study for the exams or any other things that you have to do or any courses you want to do. And there's usually a study budget. And you can speak to the postgraduate department or the medical education department of your trust or your hospital about how much money you're allotted and how much you can ask back. They have to approve it before, you know, you, you do it. Um, so definitely just speak to them, fill out that form, and they'll tell you how much you are allowed, and then you can ask for it back. Why do so many IMGs feel lost in the NHS when they say they have to do the same things as they do in home countries, like discharges, drug charts, taking samples, considering we do this in PLAB too? I don't know. I mean, I've not heard anyone say that much myself. But as a doctor, these are things that you would be expected to do, um, doing drug charts, be it written drug charts or electronic drug charts, doing discharges, writing up admissions, um, seeing the patients on a day-to-day. -day. These are very normal things that you should be expected to do, and it's, it's nothing that is really considered you know, un, uh, a non-doctor task. I, I, can, I expect that maybe there's a lot of lack of confidence or unsurety that am I doing this correctly? And maybe they kind of shy, want to shy away from doing those things. But really, it's, it's not something to feel lost about, especially when, you know, you guys could ask us at any time that you have any concerns or ask any of your other colleagues if you're confused about anything, what, you know, what should be done next. Do we have to prescribe medications as soon as we start to work? Yes. Yes, you do. Because as a doctor, that is part of your task. I mean, if you're shadowing and they tell you during your shadowing period you're not supposed to do anything, then don't do anything. But as such, you should be prescribing. And it's something to be really concerned about. I say that because if you use some of the nice little apps that they have, now I'm trying to open mine right now. So the BNF, not, not super clear on here perhaps, but the BNF is a free app that you can download onto your phone. And it has drugs, treatment summaries, medical devices, you can know about how different drugs interact with each other, the dosing, um, the amount that should be given, how many times a day. Should you take into consideration if the patient has renal impairment or a hepatic impairment, any of those things, you can easily look at your BNF and know. And if you're still confused, there are pharmacists on the ward. If the pharmacist is not on the ward, you can call them. If it's late at night, you might not get a pharmacist. You may or may not, it just depends on your hospital whether they have pharmacists on call. But for the most part, if you can back up your information either by using NICE guidelines or the BNF, or I like to use this little handy app as well called MD Calc. There are a lot of different scores on here that you can see for your patients what's most appropriate. 
um, for whatever you're looking for. For instance, the one that I use the most, and I've basically memorized it because I use it so often, is the CURB 65 score. I'm sure you guys have heard of this. But basically, you know, whether or not this patient needs to be kept in for, for their chest infection or not, and whether or not, what appropriate antibiotics. So even if you feel that you might be a little bit unsure about what you're prescribing, the nurses are going to look at what you're prescribing before you prescribe it. So if you give a patient, let's say, you know, one and a half grams of Prestamol when, you know, the, the prescribed dose is just one gram, the nurse will be like, hey, doctor, I see that you've done this. You might be right that this is what needs to be given, but I think maybe we should take this into consideration or that into consideration. But like I said, it's just, it's just about trying to be as safe as possible, looking up your information. Don't try and shy away from doing something just because you feel unsure. Rather, just ask someone. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm getting a lot of questions. I'm just trying to make sure I'm covering everything slightly. Okay, um, if a person wants to do radiology and is aiming for crest, should they do WAST or 12 months of non-training jobs? It's what you want to do in the long run. I mean, really, WAST won't help you towards radiology any more than any other non-training job if it's not specific. Really, if you want to do radiology, I will again tell you to do A&E, and let me tell you why. I don't know how many x-rays I have seen, or CT scans I've seen in A&E, but on the ward you don't really see as many because those patients come in acutely unwell. It could be a broken bone, it could be a chest infection, it could be trauma, it could be a neoplasm that we've just found or you know something in the brain, and you're looking at a bunch of scans. So um, at least in that sense, radiology, if you want to do that in the long run, A&E is a good idea. Okay, you mentioned British slangs. A couple of colleagues of mine recently started working. They said they had difficult p picking up British accents. So I will talk all day about this if I can because there are some really great British shows that I love. Um, this is just my personal opinion, but um, if you all ever watched BBC as a kid, they have some really great shows. One of my, or two of my favorites really, are Keeping Up Appearances and um, Keeping Up Appearances and what was the other one called? Are You Being Served? Both of those basically are really, really good. They have a lot of different accents, and they kind of help you understand how the, the British hierarchy of how to speak to you know, people and everything kind of works. They use a lot of slang. They, the, the content's a little old. The shows are, I think, from like the 1960s or 80s. But there are some newer shows out there. I think like one of them is um, Utopia is pretty good. It's got a lot of variety of accents. Or if you watch any British cinema, just anything that has subtitles would be good so you can kind of get a, um, a handle on the accents itself. Um, how hard is it to get leaves in initial days of work and how do we go about annual breaks? So again, this is something that you need to discuss during, during the interview process. Um, oh, sorry guys. We're having a little trouble with the camera. There we go. Um, when, when you have the interview, you should talk about your annual leave and how much time is appropriate for you. Um, to get, usually it's about 27 days if I'm not mistaken at our level, um, but in case it's anything more or less than that, you should speak to your trust. And when it comes to annual leave or sick leaves or anything like that, definitely, definitely, definitely talk to your rotor coordinator about how many days you get off, what you get off, um, how, how many days in advance you need to ask off, and what forms you need to fill. Certain departments may need you to request for a swap if you want to work on a certain day that you might have an on-call duty because they're not going to let you take off if you have an on-call duty since those are hard to, to fill. So somebody else can do that job for you and then you know you do it for them at some point in the future. Um, what is a good time to start doing on-calls after you start like a month or two months? So this is based on your own confidence level. Some people are fine after a month, some people they need an extra month or two, some people want to spend their whole first year in the NHS not doing on calls. It's totally up to you, but keep in mind if you do a basic rota, if you do any, I mean, any, any job without on calls, your, your total pay will be less because you're just getting the basic salary, not with the um, on call supplementation at the end. So do keep that in mind that if you think that you can manage and you feel better off just not doing on calls for some time, don't rush yourself. You can even speak with um, your rotor coordinators. Um, there are some times they will allow you to pick up extra shifts that maybe they were going to bring a locum in, an external locum in, and maybe you can do an on-call for that. But make sure it's a well-covered on-call. And what I mean by that is don't do a night duty. 
do something during the day on a weekday, not a weekend. So that even if you're unsure, there are a lot of people around you that you can ask for support and for help. Okay? Um, about WAST, is it a good idea to do if I have no interest in psychiatry? It's about four to five months of psychiatry and this is putting me off. It has different things, not just psychiatry. It's more towards GP and psychiatry oriented individuals. If you don't want to do either one of those, then don't do WAST. Simple as that. I know, I know a lot of people see WAST as this kind of like, oh, I should do it because then I get into first round of training if I want to apply, I can apply in first round. But really don't just apply for something for that because I applied in round two of internal medicine training and I still got in. So, and really, if you think about you're trying to do it for surgery, core surgical training is very difficult even in round one. Definitely only apply for what you think is appropriate for you and what you think you want to do. There are more than enough jobs. You just don't want to apply for anything just because. Okay. Um, sorry, hold on. I'm just making sure I've not missed anything. Okay. NHS will change some surgical specialities to straight run through instead of CT to ST3 to urology. Is that true? I've not heard anything like that as such, but I will look into it if there is anything like that, we'll update accordingly, okay? Um, process of appraisal. When should I speak to my responsible officer regarding it? Your responsible officer will, co will contact you. You don't even have to worry about that. I mean, when I started working, I think like maybe two months afterwards, they were like, okay, you're gonna have an appraisal at this and this date. This is, this is the person who'll be doing your appraisal. Make sure this is all done by this date and then submit it on this date. It's a very straightforward process. We even have a post discussing the entire appraisal process, what you should be doing at least during that time to make yourself look good and what you should be planning towards. So don't worry about appraisals at all. Can an MTI candidate apply for a junior doctor position? MTI candidates t typically are actually reg positions. So if you're already qualified for MTI, I mean, are you saying that you have an MTI post and then now you want to apply for a junior doctor post on a tier two visa? Because you can do that if you want to. But if you've already been working in this country on an MTI, I mean, for a year or two as a reg, you should understand the system. It just seems like a step backwards, but it, there's nothing that's gonna stop you. There are no MTI positions for junior doctors. It's only regs that they have these positions for. Um, to do FY2 non-training when on call, run a cardiac arrest, Paris alone. Oh, no, no, no. You are never alone. So what happens is when, when you get that little bleep on here that says cardiac arrest ward 25, you are not the only person holding this bleep, the, the cardiac arrest bleep. The other people, let's say, for instance, you are the CT1 on call. Your FY1 or FY2 will have it. Your reg will get that same bleep. There will be a critical care team in your hospital. They will get that bleep. The anesthesiologist will get that bleep. All of those people will come running to wherever they've been told to come and they will all help you manage what to do. A lot of hospitals discuss in the morning what a person's role will be in the cardiac arrest, um, during the cardiac arrest. If you don't feel super confident to do chest compressions right then and there, you can be the person who takes bloods. You can be the person who, you know, um, maintains the time. You can be the person who sees, I mean, or gives the adrenaline, the drugs when, as and when needed. But just make sure you maintain the trust. Usually the airway is maintained by anesthesiology. If you get there before them, obviously you can step into that role if you feel comfortable. But like I said before, if you don't feel comfortable, don't do it. If you don't think you can do something, say it out loud. Step back and be like, I can't do this, I'm sorry, watch. No one's gonna get mad at you for doing that because it's, it's, it's very hectic. I've been in a lot of cardiac arrests where it's, it's just chaos. There are a lot of people coming in, coming out. You don't know what's going on. One person will be leading the cardiac arrest. If you feel you can do it, go for it. I definitely wouldn't say to do it on your first time because, you know, get the feel of the system. Usually it's the reg. It could be someone else. Let them, <coughs> excuse me, let them lead. You watch how they make sure everything is being done. Okay? And we, oh, we have a post on how to prepare for ALS if any of you all are up for ALS. And I definitely recommend doing ILS before ALS. It's kind of like um, a succinct version of ALS and it really helps you prepare. All right, the work is 100% same as interning doesn't have books over the years, so I should prefer doing it in the UK. Okay, so it's up to you. If you don't want to do it in the UK, work in the UK, you don't have to work in the UK. If some people want to work in the UK, then that's up to them. I mean, it's more about if you want to work in the UK, you want to go towards something. If you want to go towards training, you know, in a certain course specialty or you're specially training towards, you know, becoming a gastroenterologist or becoming... 
a psychiatrist, whatever you want to do. If you feel that in the long run, being in the UK is what I want, then go for it. Or if you feel like in your own home country, you'll get further or it's better, go for it. It's teach its own. Um, can we use these apps on wards in A&E as well? Will our seniors be judging us for looking up drug doses? No. I know there are a lot of countries where you're kind of expected to memorize it. Everything, one of my colleagues, she's from Italy, and she was actually telling me that back home, if you don't know every single drug dose and when it should be given and how it should be given, no one's going to even consider you to be like a competent doctor. But it's not like that because, again, we're human and we understand we're human. No one's telling you to take out your phone in front of the patient and start looking at it like this, like, okay, let me see what medications you need. What would be more appropriate is... Step off to the side with, you know, the drug chart and everything. There's always going to be a little cubby where you can stand. Keep it to your side. Look and see what you need and, and then prescribe it out. Because there are going to be some new medications that you've never prescribed before. Or maybe you've prescribed in a different way back home. You need to see how it's prescribed here. No one's going to fault you for it. Okay? Um, if you intend to apply for training next year but have a three-year non-training contract, can you, you leave that non-training job or will it leave a negative impact? You can leave it. I am leaving my non-training job to join a training job. You have to properly inform them beforehand. And they kind of expect that eventually a non-training doc will move on if they have the, the want to do so. So speak to your rotor coordinator. Speak to your HR about when would be the appropriate time to let them know about you know, your, your leave. Is it a two-week notice? Is it a one-month notice? Is it a two-month notice? You need to know that. You, you shouldn't wait until the week before that you're going to be leaving and then tell them, listen, guys, I'm not going to be working here anymore. Because they need to adjust the rota accordingly. You're in the rota for months in advance sometimes. And if they don't know that you're not going to be there, they can't fill it. Considering I am... Oh, sorry. Considering I'm more interested in GP training, can I start with Amy or any other job? Yes. But again, I would say go for A&E. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep saying this over and over again. But as a GP, you will see so many patients from so many backgrounds with so many problems. And so will you You'll do the same in A&E. A&E has a minor section where you will kind of have a GP-like setting where you'll see them come in quickly and two or three things. All right, this is fine. This is fine. You can go home. Um, a lot of A&Es even keep GPs in their A&E. And then they have the GP during the day. Um, but we've we've got that all kind of covered in the blog post about working in a and &E and what you can expect. So definitely look into a and &E if you want to be a GP. How have jobs in the NHS affected your social life and hobbies? Do you feel restricted? I am doing a webinar on Saturday at like, what, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in, I mean, in the afternoon. So... Suffice to say, my social life is basically Road to UK. That might be sad. That probably is restricting my life more than my job in the NHS. Um, A&E is a little more restrictive. I will say that. Um, the hours are, are kind of weird depending on where you work. They, they may not be the most social hours, but I definitely think that when you think about an actual main rota with on-calls, since they tell you when you're working and how you're working, and you know ahead of time, you can plan your life. I mean, just the other day... Um, we drove on down to Plymouth because that's where we're going to be starting our IMT. Then we went up to London to meet with Mesley to kind of talk about how we want to make things better for job opportunity-wise for junior doctors. And then we, we, we drove on back, and that was like, a, what, two, two days? We went midweek because we had the time off, and we took the time off, and it was, it, was, it was workable, it was doable. If you plan your stuff well, you can do whatever. I mean, I have colleagues who go all across the world whenever they have the annual leave, so it's just about planning. All right. I found Oxford Handbook, a foundation program helpful. Has loads. Yes, it's very good. There are a lot of Oxford handbooks that you should definitely look into. Um, there's clinical medicine one. There's one for acute medicine. There's one for A&E. Go through it. Go through these books. Nothing will harm you. Nice guidelines, nice CKS. All of these are very good resources. There's no minimum requirement of eligibility of experience post-GMC. There is. Actually, you should go through our post on, on IMT in the sense that, okay, if you've completed 12 months of internship and then you start your first job in the NHS, and that's the only experience that you have, you cannot apply for IMT unless you will have 12 months of experience by the time that IMT post starts. I'm talking about 12 months post-internship, okay? So let's say you started working in July, Okay, July 2019, and all you had is your internship when you started working. And the IMT applications start in February. You can apply for IMT because by the time the training post for IMT starts in August, you will have worked for one year. You'll work for those 12 months. So that's what you need to keep in mind. 
Is a salary of a junior doctor enough for a living? So this is kind of a double edged or double sword question question because what is your comfort level for living and what do you need? And, and then how much salary you come in is only balanced accordingly. I've done a couple of posts on um, how to manage a good budget and how to save money in the NHS, considering how much money you're getting in. With the NHS, your, with your ID, you get a lot of discounts on a lot of things, so that's something you should always keep in mind. Two, let's say on average, you take home 2,500 pounds a month, let's say. If, <clears throat> let's say 600 goes into your salary and whatever you have left over after that is what you're basically living on day to day. Now, if you're smart about your money, if you're making sure you're not spending all 2,500 and you're saving a portion of that money, you can live comfortably. There's no reason to think that you would not be able to live comfortably. Um, what I like to do is I've set it up with my bank with every paycheck that I get, a certain proportion of my, my um, paycheck goes directly into a savings account. So I have kind of a, like a rainy day fund that if I need money for any emergency or anything like that, that's something I would definitely recommend you all doing so that you kind of know whatever you have saved that you're not touching and whatever you're using on a daily basis. Okay. I missed the deadline for FY2 training this year. Do you recommend starting a non-training post? Yeah, why not? Start working in the NHS. Understand the system. If you want to apply the next year, go for it. Apply the next year. If you don't want it, maybe you change your mind. You want to apply for something else. Just, just do what you want to do, but don't keep yourself from working in the NHS just because you're starting off in a non-training job. You're getting paid for working. I just did my graduation in pharmacy. I'm looking for pharmaceutical jobs, but they said I should have registered or have experience. Unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of information about pharmacy or pharmaceutical jobs. Um, there, I think there is a separate registration exam. You should kind of look into it. Um, I'm not really sure off the top of my head what the name of the, the exam is, but if you need registration, just like for doctors, they need GMC registration, you probably need to get that done and then start applying. But that being said, I do know there are a couple of international um, pharmaceutical graduates that do work in my hospital. So it's, it's, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's not possible. I think you just need to find the proper route to do so. All right, I will graduate this year and have to prepare for IELTS and pass until July. It means I'll pass PLAB 2 November, so I don't know if it's okay. Do you mean that you're going to do IELTS right now? Or you, is it next year? That's fine. Yeah, I mean, if you have a gap between your IELTS and your PLAB 1, that's not a problem. No one's going to have it all back to back. Or do you mean that it's going to be in the next year? That's fine, too, because UCAMLA is not even going to come in until 2022, if that's what you're concerned about. Um, work hours for, sorry, for registrar and junior doctors. All right, so this is just about junior doctors. We're just going to talk about junior doctors here. But work hours, it should, like, usually for A&E, it's about 40 hours a week. And for other um, specialities, it's about 46 to 48 hours a week. Again, speak to your own rotor coordinators, and when you have your interviews, discuss it with them how long you'll be expected to work. If a person requires you know, less time, if they want to be less than full-time, that can also be discussed because they are very amenable to adjusting towards your needs, especially if you can't always be working for the full hours. Um, but yeah. Will the IMT program be too hard for a working mother? So really, I mean... It's, it's, it's about balancing your life, and I, I can't give any experience, unfortunately, on this, but if you want to start off in a non-training CT1 post, which is basically what you would be doing in IMT anyway, except you would just be in a non-training capability, you would at least kind of get an idea of what you can and cannot do. But like I said before, they have options for less than full time. If you need to have some time with your children, with your home life, they just speak to your HR. No one will you know, fault you on wanting to have a home life. I have a lot of my colleagues who have kids who are doing IMT and they are less than full time. Or CMT, I'm sorry, not IMT, CMT. They're less than full time. They come um, three days a week or two days a week or four days a week. They don't do on calls. It works for them. And if you just discuss before you start working what works for you, I'm sure you guys will find some middle ground. Okay, but don't let that deter you. Um, I heard a new pay contract got accepted, which is say it'll reduce this junior. It's supposed to be a 2% increase if I understood it correctly. I, I, I don't remember the complete article off the top of my head, but um, it should be an increase, not a decrease, because they've been working really hard overall to try and get junior doctors to be paid more. And I think they're trying to also make sure that the hours are more suitable for a junior doctor in their in their day-to-day. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you guys are liking what we're doing. I hope, uh, we, we, I know we had a bit of a delay this morning with everything, but I'm glad that we're chugging along. We'll try and do more of these. Um, can I get a FY2 non-training, get into IMC within a year of joining, provided I have done MRCP1 or MRCP? You don't even need MRCPs done to get into IMT. I haven't done MRCP and I've gotten into IMT. Um, I did start off at a CT1 non-training, but you could still do it in FY2 non-training. My colleague is a FY2 non-training and he's starting an IMT in August as well. Um, and he's not done MRCP either. Just make sure that you have completed, the CREST form is done, your FY2 competencies have been signed off. So long as those are signed off and you meet all the other stipulations and requirements for applying, you can apply. Okay, what is the difference between MTI and IMT? Okay, MTI is the medical training initiative. That's reg level, that's not gonna be junior doctor level at all. IMT is internal medicine training. We have both um, posts covered in our blog about that, so definitely just kind of give that a run through. <clears throat> if I do 24 months of non-training job after internship back home, will I still be eligible for IMT? Yes, you will. Which is the best bank? Any Islamic bank? Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, banks are up to your own choosing if you find a bank that works for you go for it i mean a lot of people want banks that they can send money home with um it's just whatever i use natwest personally because it's very close to where i live and it has a very good app it lets me do a lot of things that i need to do with it and i'm happy with it so it's up to you um for the imt post gmc experience only nhs no it can be home experience if you do your internship at home and then you spend another 12 months at home and then you apply for imt you can do that you don't even have to start working in the nhs when i went for my imt interview i actually met a couple of people who have never worked in the nhs they only came for the imt interview so go for it can we do epic registration before apply one yeah and i definitely recommend you do mainly because sometimes people's colleges take some time um, to do it, you don't want it to be that you get to PLAB 2, you finish PLAB 2, and you're waiting for your EPIC registration so that you can get GMC done. So definitely do it before PLAB 1. If you think you can get it done out of the way, get it done. Otherwise, you could do it after PLAB 1, you can do it after PLAB 2. It just needs to be done before GMC registration. Um, I'm glad that you guys are finding this helpful. I've done my residency in neurosurgery in my home country. Does that help me in any way in the UK? Does it help me to get... So you have experience. I definitely think you should go through our post on post-graduation pathways in the UK to see how you can use that experience to, to that advantage. And we have another post about surgical specialities and how to get into surgical specialities. But it won't necessarily carry as much weight as you would want it to, especially if the GMC doesn't accept, you know, whatever exams you've taken, because they're very reluctant to accept a lot of exams. Um, so just kind of think about... If you want to do neurosurgery, think about what experience you have and how, I mean, don't sell yourself short. Talk about the experience when you go for any interviews, but it won't necessarily help you get into training faster than anyone else. Uh, as an IMG who graduated more than five years ago, what sort of jobs can I apply for if my post-graduation training is not recognized? So if it's been a while, I would definitely think you should start off as a junior doctor and don't think that you're working lower than anyone else or that you don't have any worth as a low, I mean, as a junior doctor because I know sometimes if we have a lot of experience, you feel like you're starting all over again. But don't, I'm not saying to take like an FY1 post. You can take an FY2 post or a CT1 or a CT2 post just fine. Um, and that will allow you basically just for six months to, to get a feel of how the system is, get back on your feet, understand how the system is, then go and apply for a registrar level post, okay? Um, oh, it's so nice for y'all to say that you're, you're liking what we're doing. I'm really glad. I mean, I, I really hope that if you guys do have questions, we are kind of answering it. Um, but yeah, let's see what we got. I'm trying to wrap it up. Uh, let's get these last three questions out of the way. I'm about to finish my MRCP all parts and finish my residency in internal medicine. Does my residency count as an equivalent to CT1, CT2? And can I directly apply to CT3? So, let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly. <clears throat> you are going to finish MRCP, and then I'm assuming then with that MRCP, you're going to apply for GMC registration. You can then apply for ST3 training directly if you wish. I would kind of suggest maybe doing a non-training reg post just for a couple of months to understand because the medical registrar has a lot of responsibilities. There are a lot of things you're already expected to know 
when you start working as, as a training medical registrar. So maybe do a non-training post for a little bit. You can kind of lessen the expectations and then apply into training so that you know exactly what you need to do once you are in training. Um, when are you planning to sit for MRCP? I don't know, man. It's not that I don't have the uh, work life. It's just my own procrastination, honestly. Um, while working in the NHS, is it possible to get a consultant to sign one's crest form? Yes. I was working in A&E in three months time. I had my consultant sign my crest form. Bam, it was done. Are FY2 and CT1 post the same? Can I apply to CT1 if I only have one? So I applied for a CT1 post non-training and I only had my internship experience, so you can. In terms of job, FY2s and CT1s almost do exactly the same thing. CT1s definitely have a little bit more experience or responsibilities um, and you get paid more as a CT1. So it's just up to you. <laughs> Um, it, will an MSc help as a PG degree before applying for an FY2 post? It won't really make a difference, honestly. I mean, in training, you'll get extra points in your application, but for an FY2 post, it won't make that big of a difference. Does it make a difference if non-training post is surgical and I want to per pursue a career in IMT? So I know somebody who did this, and they asked him in the interview, why are you applying for IMT if you only have surgical experience? And he just said that, you know, he changed his mind. That might be what it is for you. I don't know. Um, they won't just disregard you completely if you only have surgical experience, but be prepared in the interview portion to explain why you've done what you've done. All right, last question, guys. After GMC registration, is it recommended to get a non-training job ASAP, or can we apply for those after five to six months? It's up to you. If you don't want to apply, you don't have to. I would recommend applying just because you've got GMC registration done and out of the way and you can start working. But I know, I mean, life happens. Things go on differently for everyone else. So if you can't, then just wait on applying. But definitely try and apply as soon as possible. Um, how long did I work in a non train Oh, so I had to do one year because I only had internship experience. So that July to July, that was me. I started working in July. I got up to now this July. It's been a year now I'm working in the NHS. Um, and I'm, I applied to IMT in February, so I'm going to start in August. Okay. All right, guys, really, this is going to be the last question because we're not going to be able to wrap up everything properly, but basically how I finished internship in July, I'm about to sit for PLAB 1 in November. I'm not planning to get a job. Is that going to be an issue when I apply for a PLAB 2 visa? No, you can be unemployed and apply for a PLAB 2 visa. Um, we've discussed that extensively in our posts on how to apply. Um, you just need to show ties. You need to show who's sponsoring you. And we've got that in our UK financial sponsorship fiasco post, but basically it's not going to be a big issue. So. To wrap everything up, I really hope I answered everybody's questions about what it means to work as a junior doctor in the NHS. Um, there are probably some things that I forgot, and I do apologize for that. I tried to keep everything written down and, and, and kind of jotted out, but it happens. Um, if you do have any more questions, you can always comment below in the, in the uh, video itself once it, it's finished rendering, and we'll try and get to it. Or you can message us. We've got Facebook. We've got the website. Wherever, y'all can get in contact with us. But I hope this is really helpful, and um, yeah. Next time we'll do another blog, I mean, sorry, another webinar on another, on another topic, and I hope you guys will enjoy that one too. And thank you for watching us today and uh, for supporting us and for all your nice words. So have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.